I know what you're thinking. They let him out of jail again? Yes. Yes, they did. It's sort of a suicide squad type of situation. As Murphy told you guys when it was her turn to babysit like last week, Daniel had to swim across the Pacific. And then he uploaded two videos and now he's swimming back across the Pacific. So you're stuck with me, but don't worry. We set up one of those Santa tracker things so we can keep tabs on him as he goes across the Pacific. Oh, look at him go. All steady like across the ocean. That's wonderful. What's that dark spot moving toward him? Oh no, it looks like we lost connection with him. I don't know what to tell you guys. I'm sure he's fine. He'll be back eventually. In the meantime, welcome, welcome, welcome everybody. My name is Jackson Dicker and welcome back to another episode of the Fantasy News. <laughs> That's right. We have an Avengers type of situation with John Grisham, Jody Picoult, and George R.R. Martin among 17 authors suing OpenAI for systematic theft on a mass scale for using their copyright works without permission. The lawsuit cites specific chat GPT searches for each author, such as one for Martin that alleges the program created an infringing, unauthorized, and detailed outline for a prequel to a Game of Thrones book that was titled A Dawn of Dire Wolves. And it used the same characters from Game of Thrones. Can you guys think of anything more terrifying than being sued by wealthy writers? Like they write emotional, persuasive, and compelling things for a living. It, it just seems like they'd be a miserable bunch to go up against in court. My opinion is that if the AI are reading our books, the AI can at least go buy a copy and leave a review because that's just common courtesy. On a serious note though, AI does kind of feel like the Wild West right now. If you forbid me from reading the Game of Thrones books, but you handed me a wiki of that whole world, I too could write a Dawn of Dire Wolves. So with all the fan fiction out there and online discourse, I do think it'll be hard for these AI software companies to keep fiction out of their training unless they get really stringent about the training sources, which is probably something that should happen. Maybe they shouldn't just be allowed to use everything that exists. And maybe they should only be allowed to use, you know, specific things that they have paid for a license for or something of that sort. Regardless, and this is just a feeling, but uh, I feel like before this whole AI stuff is all said and done, that the AI companies are going to try to point the finger at fan fiction writers to try to shift some of the blame to them for this sort of thing. Being like, oh, well, they wrote fan fiction about, you know, whatever this IP is, and that's where our, our software, or, you know, our AI got it from. Who knows? I hope not, but it wouldn't surprise me. In writer strike news, a bunch of the big CEOs from these production companies, such as the RAT CEO, were all present for the latest bargaining session between the Writers Guild of America and the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. According to Hollywood Reporter, and I'm saying that because I am not an expert on such things, it is highly unusual for the industry bargaining representative to include CEOs directly in the bargaining session. So maybe this is a very good sign or maybe it's a very bad sign. Not sure. A source said that the CEOs have cleared their calendars and want to sit and have a real conversation, which like it, sure, it's nice that the CEOs want to have as few people in the room as possible to have a meaningful conversation. But I can't imagine the CEOs of these massive soulless corporations being able to get off their high horse for two seconds to be able to concede anything. So I'm really not confident that this is like a great sign of anything because it just seems like the people with the most emotions and ego invested in it maybe shouldn't be present in the room for uh, these strenuous conversations. Okay, we've talked about a lot of really annoying stuff and that we're all tired of hearing about. So now we're gonna talk about some fun bookish stuff by digging into some cover reveals. Tor, in particular, has always been busy, but they have been very busy lately. We got the Fireborn Blade by Charlotte Bond. The dragon looks dope, but personally, I'm not a big fan of the like, sort of realistic-y person with the stylized dragon. That's just me, but uh, maybe just some weird quirk that I have, but I just it looks weird to me paired together. However, uh, I love the marketing blurb that they have for the book, which is kill the dragon, find the blade, reclaim her honor. It's that or end up like countless nights before her as a puddle of gore and molten armor. If you guys can't tell by now, 
I'm a moron. So a, going into a book with a checklist of the three things we gotta get done is perfect for the shallow ridges adorning my brain. Tor also announced Foul Days by Genevieve Demova. I love this cover. Everything about it, the sense of being down low in this epic city where these shadowy monstery things are poised to strike. It's an awesome cover, and the story itself sounds pretty cool too. The main character trades her magic to escape her abusive ex, but ends up needing to get her magic back because of a sickness that only affects witches that don't have their magic. FanFiAddict.com is a fantastic blog that specializes in speculative fiction book reviews, and they did a cover reveal for The Anatomy of Fear, which is a horror anthology from a group of talented indie authors, including SPF B07, nailed that on my first try, finalists L.L. McRae and H.L. Tinsley, as well as gunmetal gods author Zamil Akhtar. They crammed all the scariest things you can think of into a cover, and you know what? It worked. It's a cool cover. Lee Bardugo, author of Six of Crows and the Grisha Trilogy, has a new book called The Familiar coming out on April 9th, 2024, that I'm hell-bent on reading. It's a historical fantasy that's inspired by her family's history, and she said it is the most romantic and most character-driven story she's written so far. When she mentioned the bit about it being inspired by her family's history, she said that there were lots of ghosts looking over her shoulder and uh, adding their suggestions and opinions as she was writing, which, I don't know, maybe some people would find creepy, but I find that as just a really sweet, precious image of just like her ancestors looking over her shoulder and kind of cheering her on as she's writing it. Last but not least, we got Amber Chen's YA silk punk fantasy debut called Of Jade and Dragons. Uh, it got a cover reveal, so <sighs> no notes on this one. Absolutely gorgeous. The designers were Chen and Lee and they knocked it out of the park on this one. Hey guys, it's me, Daniel Green, the Goblin Man. I wanted to tell you guys to go check out the three hour fringe deep dive I posted. I asked Jackson about it, and even though he hasn't seen the actual show, he says he finds the video wildly more entertaining than it has any right to be. I'm just kidding, guys. It's me, Jackson, in this skin suit. Okay, so that's been a lot of cool, exciting stuff all in one go. We're gonna keep on weaving the fun stuff in with the bad stuff, and we're gonna get through this together. Do you hear me? Actor Stephen Fry, which is one of those guys that I know I have seen him in everything, but for the life of me right now, I could not tell you a single movie that he's been in. He narrated the Harry Potter books, so that's over a million words in total. His voice from those audiobooks were taken by AI software, and uh, they managed to plug it all into their shenanigans. I don't know how computer science works. And without his consent, they replicated his voice to narrate a historical documentary. His voice could theoretically be used to say anything at all. And audio is just the beginning. This isn't something super new. I mean, people have been doing this for months with like Joe Rogan's voice and like uh, big pop star artists and things like that. But that doesn't make it any less scary. Uh, a future where deep fake videos are just easy to make and abundant is just horrifying to imagine. Anyway, I couldn't put it any better than how Brian Cranston did back in July, so I'll just let him take it from here. We will not be having our jobs taken away and giving to robots. We will not have you take away our right to work and earn a decent living. And lastly, and most importantly, we will not allow you to take away our dignity. I'm so tired. Okay, happy thing now. Hilda season three is coming to Netflix on December 7th. If you guys are tired, if you guys are worn out by the constant state of chaos in the world, if you liked shows like Gravity Falls that have just the right amounts of cozy and spooky and anonymous conflict, I am begging you to go watch this show. It is delightful. It is a kid's show, sure but it's definitely one that adults can enjoy. I love this show. We also found out in a document released as part of the FTC versus Microsoft case, that Elder Scrolls VI isn't expected to launch until at least 2026, which, wow, that was announced back in what, like 2018? Uh, sure, we all knew that Elder Scrolls VI was coming eventually. They aren't just going to abandon an IP that makes them an absurd amount of money but I still can't fathom why you would announce it so early. Um, on behalf of companies, I'd like to go ahead and announce the following things. We've got Cyberpunk 2777, uh, GTA 12, Pokemon Heaven and Hell versions, 
Fallout 5 coming 5, 5, 2035, and Tony Hawk, Cyberpunk. The British Science Fantasy Association named The Spear Cuts Through Water by Simon Jimenez as best fantasy novel at FantasyCon. I didn't see a date on the announcement, like, like specifically best fantasy novel of 2023 or anything, so I can only assume that they are saying this is the best fantasy novel of all time. High praise there. High praise. Next up, people are all up in arms over Millie Bobby Brown's debut novel, uh, mainly that it was ghostwritten and Brown's name is the one all over the cover. I have mixed feelings on this one. On the one hand, Brown has been pretty open about the book being ghostwritten, which seems like a good thing, being transparent and setting expectations. Plus, uh, the cover design is usually out of the author's hands, and uh, if I were the publisher, yeah, I would absolutely be pushing Brown's name over uh, the ghostwriter's name, because Brown's name is what is going to sell this novel. But at the same time, I've always thought it was weird when blatantly ghostwritten novels don't require the real author's name anywhere on the cover. I can't help but be happy for the ghostwriter, of course. This was probably a big step for her career, and it's hard for me to point at writers getting paid for their work in 2023 and say, oh, that's a bad thing. Especially when there's a decent chance in 40 years, ghostwriting isn't as valid a profession anymore because AI just writes the books for us. At least Brown is being really open about it. She even said in an Instagram post with the ghostwriter, I couldn't have done it without you, which like, duh, she wrote the book for you, literally. Ghostwriting, not bad. Transparent and putting ghostwriters' names on the book cover, those would be good things in my opinion, but if you're gonna be upset about Millie Bobby Brown, you're gonna throw up when I tell you about James Patterson. It's all cool news. It's all cool news from here on out, so don't, don't even worry. There's no more interweaving the bad with the good. Next up, we got an announcement for Tales of the Shire, which uh, is some kind of cozy Hobbit-themed video game coming in 2024. Sounds great to me. When it comes to Lord of the Rings, I am such a filthy brain dead consumer. They slap Tolkien's name on anything and I will throw money at it. I literally avoided Magic the Gathering for years, much to my friend's dismay. And well, let's just say I can't stay away from Lord of the Rings. Although the Gollum game was apparently where I draw the line on my Lord of the Rings consumption. Good for me. I have standards. I had no idea. And then insanely random, we are getting an Onimusha anime on Netflix November 2nd. For those of you who are out of the loop, these were games back in the PS2 era, which they just stopped making for some reason, despite everyone liking them. But this show has a legendary director, martial artists, and writers behind it. And based on the trailer, y'all, this looks awesome. It has everything. Badass martial arts, a ticking clock built into the story, a protective dynamic with a child who has lost everything. The trailer is unreal. It's gorgeous and epic. And if the show itself has even 10% of the quality and cool factor, then it is worth watching. Seriously, go watch the trailer for yourself. It's amazing. I can't hype it up enough. Please be good, please be good, please be good, please be good. And last but certainly not least, we have the most unhinged Sanderson interview you've ever seen. What makes it so unhinged, do you ask? Well, it's between Sanderson and yours truly in a Between Two Ferns style format. So if you're interested in watching that, there's a link in the description below. But if you wanna see if it's even worth a click, here's one of the questions I asked in my interview. It's obvious to me, the more that I read the Cosmere books, that you're doing your best to take every half decent magic system idea possible. Yeah, I, I wanna, I'm gonna leave the world bereft, yeah. I mean, you've got color-based, soul-based, mm -hmm. physics-based, metal-based, fairy-based, and then in Yumi, you've, you've hit a new low by making rock stacking into a magic system. Mm -hmm. So is it true that the reason you write so fast is so that you're the first one to utilize these concepts to create a magic system so that any future aspiring authors are doomed to be uh, deemed a copycat? I will send you to Wit's epilogue to uh, The Way of Kings. And then I just want to make it clear here that I have dibs on both vitamins and hormones. So you, you can't do either of those for magic Hormone systems. based magic system yes. or vitamin based magic system? They're copyrighted and everything, so don't make I, me send you a okay. cease and desist. Um, do you know that what a copyright is? No, I have no idea. Okay, because. <laughs> I Googled it one time before this. Yeah, because the you would want trademarks on this. Well, maybe I'll look into that. Yeah, then. or patents. Patents, you'd want patents on those. Can I Good hire luck. you to, mm -hmm. to make that? Mm, uh, no, you could, you could hire my people. I'll trade you vitamins. Oh, you'll trade me vitamins for a patent on hormones? Yeah. Okay. Now, 
which way you're spelling hormones. Is this is a test? Yeah. Oh, and did I mention it's my birthday today? Here's my driver's license with all of the important details and numbers covered up. Maybe just take that into account when you think about going to click on that video and maybe leaving a like, commenting, subscribing. No, don't subscribe. That's moving too fast. Our relationship isn't there yet, but maybe a nice comment. But that's it for the fantasy news. If Daniel ever manages to climb his way out of that horrific sea monster that got him somewhere in the middle of the Pacific, then he'll be back. Otherwise, I guess Murphy and I will just trade off weeks back and forth and we'll just we'll keep this bad boy afloat until Daniel gets back. Thanks for watching everybody. Is there anything I'm forgetting? Oh crap. Was there supposed to be a Wraith Mark sponsorship in here? Buy Neon Ghosts! Buy Neon Ghosts! Everybody go buy Neon Ghosts! Check out uh, Neon Ghosts. Uh, everybody go check out Neon Ghosts. I heard they have a great new book out called Neon Ghosts. I hear good things about this new book they got out, Neon Ghosts. Something about Neon Ghosts? <laughs>